So let's talk about this course. Um, over dinner last night, we had a conversation essentially about what good could this course do. And it was a very useful conversation because, you know, here we have around the table a very excellent example of a biodiversity informatics institution, Sanbi, in a developing country, in an African country, that's done very, very nice work in making a lot of biodiversity data available. We have a representative from Brazil who has similarly taken a country from essentially nothing to a very major amount of, of biodiversity information online. Chris Kristolka is coming from a university in the US. And also, I remember in his job interview, he said, you hire me, I place, the, place KU as one of the world leaders in biodiversity informatics. Remember that? Yeah. And you'll hear from Jorge Soberon, who was in Mexico, and Mexico, the government, decided to step into this world of biodiversity informatics and did rather successfully. So those are kind of four case studies. But if any one of you in your home country were to be part of or be leading a parallel effort, let's say Madagascar or Ghana or, or the Congo, wherever, the very interesting fact is that your set of constellations is going to be completely different. So Chris has to deal with the academic world and essentially how do you sell biodiversity informatics to people who care about academic performance? And Tanya and Jorge have to essentially deal with this on a governmental basis. How do you sell this to the minister or whoever it is is one or two or three steps up in the governmental hierarchy? And Banderle has done this from essentially an independent institution. So there are all sorts of different situations. There are all sorts of different contexts. And certainly, the sets of players will be different in every single country. So the question is, what can we do usefully in a week with a bunch of smart people around the table? right? Some who've done this before and some who are, are well placed to potentially do this in the future. So what do we need? I mean, you, you know the basic message. We're talking about biodiversity loss. We're talking about loss of ecosystem services. And governments and NGOs and entities worldwide are very conscious that these are important losses. The, certainly data exists. Okay? We don't often know how much data exists, whether it's enough. And very, very frequently, nobody's put the data together. So I make the difference between data, which are just kind of raw materials, versus information. So the data exists in some unknown quantity, and information is awfully scarce. A point that I'll throw out to you is that if you have particular interests in Benin, Nobody's going to take care of the best interests of Benin with respect to biodiversity except Benin. And so if there are regional, national, subnational, local concerns, those need to be dealt with by the people who are concerned with, with, with those issues. Um, And so kind of the logical consequence of that set of reasoning is the abilities, the expertise, the facilities, the infrastructure to get this work done needs to be assembled on these levels, each at its own uh, level of, of need, and hopefully feeding between levels. Hopefully 
Sanbi is supporting the next level down, the, the district, state, province level. And the district, state, province level hopefully is, is helping individual natural areas. Okay, so essentially that's, that's the, the rationale behind this course. But what do we see as far as information? This is my opinion. Maybe it's completely wrong and maybe we can have a good argument about it. Um, but what do we see as far as information? Here's a, here's a compilation of biodiversity hotspots, distribution and protection of conservation priority areas. Or here are the, the hot spots around the world, and there's some really interesting things in here. Notice that all of Madagascar is a hot spot, right, Dimby? But notice that the only thing important in, in South Africa is this southern and southwestern fringe. And all that other stuff, notice, sorry, Jean, but the Congo is pretty much left out. Right? <laughs> so, so where does this come from? And what drives, you know, this being important versus this? You know, did the Nigerians pay their dues and the Congolese not? Or what's, what's behind this? In this case, I've actually looked at it pretty carefully, and it's apparently a distillation of diversity and threat. It, that's what it is on paper. But there's no quantitative protocol. There's no workflow that takes you to identifying hotspots, right? So again, if the DRC doesn't look after its interests and do its information development, we can't sit back and wait for global interests to do this for them. Here's another one. Important bird areas in Africa and associated islands. Okay. Priority sites for conservation. What do they all have in common? I could have put up 20 more examples. But what do these have in common? They all refer to the biodiversity, and they're all in some sense spatial or geographic. Okay. Interestingly, they're also all developed by global entities. You know, some organization that calls itself world something or uh, you know, mammals of, but not any entity that's interested or focused on any particular region. And so these entities, organizations, have global interests and global motives and their objectives are their objectives, and they may be very noble, but they may also not serve the continental, regional, national, subnational, and local interests. So certainly there have been such efforts. Here's, here's an example from Colombia that's relating protected areas to endemic bird areas and protected areas to uh, well-preserved forests. And then here's something I pulled off of the Sanbi page where it's a, rela a, a relation of protected areas to priority and potential corridors to connect up areas. So this sort of product comes out of national and regional efforts that can look to national and regional interests. But it's an awfully complex field. So uh, this is from a paper that, that um, a couple of us got together and published a few years ago. It's a, it's a framework. It may not be the best or the only framework, but essentially it takes us from genotype through phenotype, through kind of organismal operations to the environment, to the effects of humans. Um, and we kind of front and center put niche and population ecology basically because that's the field that we all worked in. Um, and over here, biodiversity loss. And then we have all of these kind of information products that come out of that. It might be hypotheses as far as evolutionary history, it might be taxonomies, 
might be information about geographic distributions, forecasts of change, and very specific conservation and management strategies. But essentially, to take on these challenges like I showed you examples of, we really need to take some set of this network and tie all the pieces together. For example, for corridors for movement of large African mammals, maybe we need to deal with you know, geographic distributions, environment, human presence, and essentially get that piece of this network. Okay? This requires expertise, it requires experience, it requires infrastructure, facilities. So essentially that's, that's the motivation behind why develop biodiversity informatics institutions here in South Africa or in Kenya or where have you. Um, essentially what, what we're going to try to do in this course is talk about the why and we'll do that via a series of essentially four case studies. Sanbi, Conabio, Kriya, KU. Okay? We're going to talk about strategies or at least elements of strategies that are potentially important in implementing institutions uh, of this sort. I hope that there will be a lot of ideas of interest thrown around and debated. I hope we can keep this at a first name basis. Um, but let's, let's have some good in-depth discussions. And in creating the program, we tried our very best to leave a lot of time for discussion. Um, and then the, the perpetual goal of, oh yes, and I also want to capture it digitally so that it can go beyond this group of people. So here's a really quick overview of the program. Where you see blue is where I'll be talking to you. So this is Monday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and this is the morning, and this is the afternoon. So you can see this green block, and that is uh, Tanya and Selwyn talking to us about some of the, the Sanbi experience. Um, I'll come back after lunch and give a, a brief comment about the importance of open access to data. And then look at this, round table and open question and answer, which is to say free form, whatever you guys want to talk about. So make lists of questions, jot things down, let's make very good use of that, essentially free time that's most of the afternoon after lunch. Tomorrow, we're going to start out with uh, three videos that are, are uh, lectures or topics that Jorge Soberon uh, taped for us. And so tomorrow, we'll start out with some very general commentary from Jorge Soberon about what is policy and how does biodiversity and biodiversity information relate to and translate into policy. Um, then Chris Kristolka will talk to us about essentially an academic example, how you take the University of Kansas and make it into a biodiversity informatics institution. After lunch, I'll come in with some, some general commentary uh, about what I call the biodiversity initiative game. Essentially, how do you come in, raise $10 million very quickly, employ a bunch of people, exist for five years, and then disappear. Okay? Uh, and then look at this, more time for discussion. Third day, uh, we'll start off with some comment from Bunderle about sharing data versus hoarding data, what Vanderlei likes to refer to as data crocodiles. Uh, I'll give some comments. We'll have a bit of a, a discussion. And then in the afternoon, we'll get back to the CREA example. This is a, a standalone institution in Brazil that's done some very, very nice work 
at enabling biodiversity data in Brazil. Another video from Jorge and some discussion, hopefully live with Jorge. We'll come back for some more Conabio on Friday morning. More of Chris, but Chris wearing a GBIF hat this time. Um, some commentary from Vanderlei on similar um, lines, and then a lot of more discussion. So you see 30, 40, 50% of this course is what we all make of it by having some really good, really incisive, really carefully thought out discussion, okay? So don't be shy. Each day, um, we'll start the lectures at nine, do two hours, and we'll have a half hour break so that you can shake the cobwebs out of your, out of your head, um, and then another hour and a half, and then lunch. Uh, another hour and a half, a break, and another hour, and we stop. So a lot of break time, and ideally that time will be spent in one-on-one -on -one discussions or five-on-five -on -five discussions. Um, but the idea is use the whole day. We will ask you to be out at the cabs in, in the hotel by 8.15 so that we're here well in advance of 9. And that's kind of the, the constant plan. You can basically plan on that. We'll try not to run over time, although I'm surely doing that already, yes. Here are the people that will be talking with you, um, Tanya, Vanderlei, Chris, and Jorge in electrons, if not in person. Um, and then Kate is sitting over there. Most of you have had a lot of communication with Kate, and you know me. Um, so, you know, from Kate and from me, anything we can do to help you, just let us know.